What's up, everyone? I'm here at Taipei Blockchain Week. I'm here with Wayne, the co-founder and CEO of XREX Exchange, based in Taiwan. And I'm going to ask him for alpha that only he can know about Asia, about regulation, about solvency, all these proof of reserve stuff, about lending. It's going to be a blast. But first, I'm going to give Wayne a quick minute to um, give an introduction about himself. All right. Thanks very much for having me, Kevin. Uh, my name is Wayne. I'm co-founder and CEO to Xrex. My background: um, I started programming very young, and I studied computer science until I completed my PhD in cybersecurity. And then, uh, together with colleagues, we started our first cybersecurity startup called Armorize. Uh, we offered enterprise security solutions, predominantly to U.S. enterprises. Uh, we sold our company to a cybersecurity leader, listed on Nasdaq and based in Silicon Valley in Sunnyvale, called Proofpoint, okay. in 2013. Um, so then I moved to Sunnyvale, and uh, we all worked under Proofpoint for another five years. Uh, meanwhile, a lot of us became uh, Bitcoiners. Okay. Uh, we loved uh, Satoshi's vision, and the, you know. Uh, the Bitcoin white paper, and we got into Bitcoin quite early. Um, and then, uh, so after five years at Proofpoint, we finally had an opportunity to do something uh, in in blockchain in Web3. So in uh, later half of 2018, we started our second startup, Xrex. Uh, so now it's been about four and a half years, okay. and we are a U.S. dollar-based uh, fiat to crypto currency, uh, uh, fiat to crypto exchange that's focused on servicing emerging markets like India, Africa, mm, interesting Southeast Asia, and the Middle East. Awesome. So I guess one thing, um, especially after the FTX collapse, that all exchange operators are thinking about is the coming regulation in 2023. Yes. Um, so I guess first I want to start broad and ask you about how you see regulation in Asia versus regulation in the West or like U.S. specifically. Mm -hmm. Right. Can you just talk broad strokes about maybe the differences you see about regulators, regulation, anything in the area between the two sides of the ocean? Sure. Um, and uh, I we do not offer our services to U.S. persons, uh, but I, I personally take a very keen interest in learning about how regulators think. Uh, in the U.S., uh, we do have a Canadian money service business license, mm, okay. um, and uh, we have multiple licenses in Europe. And we spent uh, more than two and a half years working with the Singaporean banking regulator, MAS, for the major payment institution license, which is really an umbrella of licenses that cover both TradFi and also uh, crypto. Okay. So there is a digital payment token uh, category Got under it. the major payment institution license that we're also applying for. So, uh, so we do spend a lot of time understanding uh, how regulators are thinking. And I think one similarity obvious similarity that we're seeing is um, I think stable coins mm -hmm. are seen as a useful uh, and uh, high potential payment tool both by US regulators and also by Asian regulators. Uh, especially uh, Singapore. Okay. And so I think stable coins for use of payment, not for use of trading or speculation, right. speculative trading, is going to be the first to be regulated uh, and um, to have specific licenses for. And I was, uh, I was very impressed with the stable coins report that was published end of last year by the President's Special Working Group on Financial Markets in the U.S., led by um, the U.S. Treasury and participated by 
FDIC and Office of the Controller of the Currency. Uh, and uh, I really enjoyed the multiple hours of hearings at the House and Senate, um, witnessed by Ms. Liang, okay. Deputy of the U.S. Treasury. Um, and I learned a lot from those hearings, and I feel that they've got a lot of things right regarding stablecoins. Yeah, they, they understood, they really understood um, how stablecoins work and their potential and how to regulate them. Um, and I'm seeing the same from Singaporean regulators, especially uh, next week we're flying over to have yet another round of interview with uh, Singapore MAS. Um, and, um, and I also think that they understand a lot about um, stable coins and, and how to regulate stable coin issuers and also how to regulate financial institutions like us that are making use of stable coins and offering stable coin access to our customers. That makes a lot of sense. And that makes me, um, reminds me of some people I know went to Token 2049 in Singapore. Mm -hmm. um, and they said the atmosphere there was popping and it wasn't, didn't feel like a bear market. And they talked to regulators who seemed to have more appetite um, for blockchain crypto technologies rather than like in the states where things are kind of gloomy and very uncertain in this bear market so is that how you see it too or can you kind of share your personal yeah opinions? i was uh, i was very impressed with uh overall with uh the singaporean banking regulator mas uh throughout the year I felt that starting last year, they took a very progressive um, attitude towards regulating uh, cryptocurrency companies and allowing and helping these companies to land in Singapore and also to grow in, uh, in Singapore and from Singapore uh, to do global business. Um, obviously, uh, right around Token 2049 and, um, and also at the Singapore Fintech uh, Forum, SFF, SFF, which is one of the largest uh, Fintech trade shows in Asia and a main event for Singapore MAS. Um, I felt that, uh, I had felt that they would be in a difficult spot. Uh, but I think they, they nailed it. They handled it perfectly. Why I'd say that they, I had thought that they'd be in a difficult spot was because, um, because of their progressive and supportive approach, uh, a lot of companies went to Singapore uh, to establish their headquarters and to apply for various MAS licenses, right? But then a lot of these companies blew up in Singapore. Right, right, I know. Right. Um, so I thought, you know, I thought this year um, with these uh, major events, it would be, you know, it would put MAS in a, in a difficult spot. But they nailed it. And the message was very clear that they're going to continue to support blockchain and cryptocurrency. Um, the managing director's opening keynote at SFF um, for example, we, I saw slides on um, atomic settlement, okay. um, on uh, programmable money, tokenized assets, stable coins, CBDCs, right? Basically, I, I thought, okay, so 80% of this keynote is about blockchain, which right. was really impressive. But at the same time, how they justify the fact that just some companies blew up in Singapore is the message is very clear. For now, the Singaporean regulators do not want to support speculative trading, do not want to support retail trading of altcoins, okay. right? And they really want to focus on stable coins 
and CBDCs and tokenized assets, these three, right? Tokenization of real world assets and also how to leverage blockchain or decentralized ledger technology to further inclusive financial access in emerging markets right. by the use of stable coins and CBDCs. That makes sense, yeah. yeah. Um, does that worry you though in terms of, I also heard that the incoming PM of Singapore um, said the same thing you said, right? Like they want to less speculative stuff. And also in Canada, because you mentioned you have a Canadian license, they, if I'm not mistaken, they banned all margin trading, even for their institutional investors, which sounds kind of crazy. And people are like, this is an overreaction unrelated to what happened at FTX. Um, so how do you see that as an exchange operator, right? Because that kind of affects your business. I don't know if you have um, margin products, derivatives products in Canada, and then also Singaporean retail traders, like what's gonna yeah. happen? So our strategy is really to work with regulators and to go jurisdiction by jurisdiction. Today, our exchange, we do not service Chinese, Japanese, US persons and Singaporeans and Canadians, for example, and in all of the sanctioned countries, right? And the reason is because we do not have enough licenses yet in these jurisdictions for us to feel that we have permission to operate right right in a compliant way so we rule these out um and uh we don't uh, we also don't service sanctioned countries high-risk countries for exactly. example so we go we really just have to go jurisdiction by jurisdiction and the products and services we offer in the jurisdictions that we feel we can offer these services uh, tend to be different Got as it. well. Got it. That makes sense. Um, so I want to ask you about bills. I don't know if you've been following bills mm -hmm. in the U.S. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, so for those watching, any, like, senator or congressperson can put out a bill. doesn't mean it has any chance of getting passed. Um, but given all the urgency of recently, people are predicting that bills are actually going to be passed in mm -hmm. 2023. There's a stable going bill. Um, wondering if you think that will be passed. And mm -hmm. then maybe like Senator Lummis, who's the Bitcoin bull, she has a bill out. Yep. A lot of people like that bill. Anyways, uh, what do you have to say about bills that you think may be passed in the U.S.? Yeah, um, so I, I look forward to good bills eventually being passed. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of benefits. Uh, I, I wear two hats, right? I'm, um, I'm the CEO to a centralized financial institution, XREX. At the same time, I also participate actively in other DeFi projects, for example, Unitas, uh, which is a DeFi protocol. Um, so I'm wearing my XREX CEO hat as a centralized financial institution that really leverages blockchain rails. There's actually a lot of advantages to this industry being more and more regulated. I'll give an example, right? This time, we saw right before FTX went down, uh, Sam turned from you know, arguing to CZ on Twitter to looking to CZ and Binance as their lender of last resort. Right. right. And Binance signed an MOU, but eventually uh, said that the insolvency uh, gap was too big right, right. for them to fill. So what this told us is, okay, FTX, they were looking for a lender of last resort, just that they had no one other than Binance, and Binance did not have that much money right. to bail them out. We saw the exact same thing in 2008, right? With Bear Stearns, with uh, Merrill Lynch, Lehman Brothers, um, and we also saw 
um, that um, at that time, Hank Polson had one knee on the ground to Ms. Pelosi at the U.S. Congress, right? So at that time, uh, Polson was not discussing what went wrong with these banks, right? Because as the banking regulator, as secretary to the U.S. Treasury, these banks cannot go down under right. his watch. There's no way he's going to let these banks go down. So he was, uh, well, not him, but um, the U.S. Treasury and the regulators were at that time stepping up to be these banks' lender of last resort. And this particular lender of last resort is much more powerful than Binance because the this is the, money. yes. <laughs> This is someone who has a money printer. Exactly. Right? So that's what happened in 2008. And that's what saved at least Bear Stearns and Merrill Lynch. And we had the same thing happen in Taiwan to one of our Taiwanese banks, right? Taishin Hang, um, in 2008. And our banking regulator did exactly the same thing, came out to say the bank is safe, right? Um, and so. I mean, regulators really have two big jobs, to understand and uh, regulate an, an, an industry well, and to, to audit this industry. And then the second job is to really help the industry grow and make sure that, the, that nothing goes wrong with the industry that's being regulated, right? So. Um, so let's say that um, we pass a stable coins bill in the U.S., a good one, let's say, right, hopefully. And then uh, stable coin issuers like Circo is able to get uh, uh, a federal bank license mm -hmm. together with some specific stable coin license. And it's going to be FDIC insured. Right now, if one day Circo runs into trouble, then we do have a strong lender of last resort, right? So I, I, I you know, there, there are many, there actually, it, it is how our financial systems have worked so far. Right, um, right. So, um, and that bill specifically, what do you think that means for decentralized or algorithmic stable coins? Maybe not as risky as like Luna, but like DAI, for example, over collateralized ones. Yeah, good question. So. I like to, I don't like to use the term algorithmic, right? Because there's a lot of algorithms. Uh, I like to use the term um, exogenously reserved or exogenously collateralized or endogenously collateralized, right? In Terra Luna's case, it's endogenously collateralized by itself, itself <laughs> right? A token uh, that, uh, that itself minted. Whereas MakerDAO, all of the collateral is exogenous to MakerDAO. They're, right. they, they're not using MKR as their collateral. Um, and also, so MakerDAO is, is a exogenously over-collateralized stablecoin protocol. And it's a DeFi one, so you have a lot more transparency versus um, a CFI stablecoin like Tether or Circle. Right. So in that respect, you know, um, there's already a lot, of, a lot of additional benefits that we get from using DAI, especially the transparency part. Um, now, when it comes to eventually getting licenses, um, I think I would hope that centralized stablecoin issuers are forced eventually to be regulated yeah. and to have these licenses and then to have regulators that also support them and help them grow and make sure that they're all right and in the worst case of the worst case become their lender of last resort, Got right? It. Got it. Like in what happened in 2008. Um, but at the same time that regulators can leave room for exogenously over-collateralized DeFi protocols. Why? Because we already have a lot of transparency with these protocols, right? If something is wrong with these protocols, 
a lot of people are going to know. A lot of analysts um, and companies like Nansen, DeFi Lama, uh, CryptoQuant, you know, the industry is going to be watchful. And exactly. because of that, I think they d deserve more room. Agreed, agreed. Okay, so I want to move away from regulations and ask you about exchange solvency because you're an mm -hmm. exchange operator and there's yes. a lot of debate, heated debate on Twitter these days about it. Um, specifically proof of reserves and kind of their limitations, right? Can you talk to me about your view of proof of reserves and how exchanges can give their customers more confidence that they have all their assets? Sure. Um, and that's something that a lot of people here at XRX are very passionate about. We're about to release our version of proof of solvency, uh, as well as open sourcing uh, most of the code base for the community to audit and also to reuse if they like. Um, first, I, I think um, because now we're getting into the realm of regulation, compliance, and also accounting, uh, I'm, I'm really hoping that we as an industry really get our terminology right, right? So um, proof of reserves, first of all, proof of reserves is not enough, right? You really need, on one hand, you need, you need to show how much reserves you have or how much custodied assets you have. On the other hand, you have to show how much liabilities you have, right? And your liabilities has to be, uh, has to match your custody assets, mm -hmm. right? For you to be solvent. So for an exchange to be solvent. So a better term would be proof of solvency, which really includes two proofs, two independent proofs, proof of assets and proof of liabilities. But legally and accounting-wise speaking, proof of solvency is not accurate. It's not the best term. It's over-promising, right? Because let's say an exchange is custodying 10,000 Bitcoins and has a liability of 10,000 Bitcoins. All right. That means every single last Bitcoin can be withdrawn, right? That's great. But that does not mean that the exchange is solvent as a company. The exchange, for example, may owe debt, right? Um, may, may have creditors, may owe taxes, may owe employee salary, right? And so um, even in the case where you, you have written this into a company's articles of incorporation that and the exchange's users have the highest liquidation preference, the highest preference as a creditor, and so that in case of an insolvent situation, let's say the exchange ran out of money and owes employee a salary and owes the government taxes, you know, and owes other creditors, that the customers has the highest preference to claim back these assets, right? The assets custody by the exchange. Even if this is well written into the exchange's articles of incorporation, it doesn't mean that in case of such insolvency that users will be made whole. And the reason is because articles of incorporation cannot trump, usually, uh, labor laws and taxation laws. Right? So when exchange you know, owes employee a salary, then per labor law, I'm sorry, you know, um, the liquidation lawyers are going to liquidate a part of the custody assets, which belongs actually to the users, the customers, to first pay employees the old salaries, and then also to pay the old taxes, for example. Right? So, so it's a complicated situation. We, we as exchange operators, should not be over-promising. 
So we feel at XREX, the right terminology should be something like proof of custodial asset solvency, Makes right? Sense. We're proving that we're solvent in terms of our custodied assets. And so proof of custodial asset solvency should, in, should include two separate proofs. Proof of custodial assets and proof of custodial liabilities. And proof of assets is, an e uh, is a much easier proof. Exactly. Right, because everything's on chain, you just have to give people your wallet address and you know. Do uh, a signature, things like that. Yeah, and, and people can kind of figure out, right? Of course you can cheat, you can, you know, always, you can borrow assets that's not yours. Yeah. Um, and then, then they give it back and stuff. So there are still ways to cheat. Uh, but as a centralized exchange, proof of custodial liabilities is the much harder proof because all of the liability ledger is a black box ledger, it's a centralized ledger that sits only within the centralized exchanges database. Exactly. And so this is the hard part. And um, this part, there are ways to to offer this proof while allowing every single user to independently verify uh, this, this proof. Because every single user, although I as a user, I wouldn't know any other user's balance, mm -hmm. right? And I don't know the total balance. I know one truth, and that is my own balance exactly. every night. Right, so then every user can use this one point of truth to verify the entire um, proof, to verify that when calculating the total liabilities that the exchange included my part of the liabilities into its total. Right, exactly. Of course, this, there's a lot of ways to cheat. Um, and a, a good written paper that was published recently is by uh, a Swiss co-founder and chief of cryptography. Uh, sorry, I forgot it's okay. his name. Um, it was a very well written paper. There's a lot of ways to cheat. For example, you can have a negative um, balance. You can create fake accounts with negative balances. That's an easy way to cheat. There are many other ways to cheat, right? So still other ways to cheat. Um, but um, but at least this type of proof can be generated automatically and at a very high frequency. Let's say every Got month, it. every week, or every day. Um, so we're generating that. At the same time, I think uh, any exchange should also have periodic external uh, audits um, by reputable auditors. Yeah, you beat me to it. I was going to ask you about that. Um, there's a lot of rumors and smoke and complaints about like Binance, other exchanges using like Mazars. Um, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I'm not sure. What, I guess, regardless of the audit specifically, what is your take on all those rumors about um, these exchanges not doing things the kosher way per se? Yeah, so um, we're in the midst of contracting our uh, proof of custodial uh, asset solvency auditor. And um, it's not easy. We really would like to contract one of the big four, but um, not all of them are proficient with this type of audit or are confident enough to perform this type of audit, you will also need quite many tools, right? You'll need a tool set to be able to do a good job. Um, and then we have some smaller firms like um, uh, Armenino and right. like uh, th this other one, which I don't know how to pronounce either, <laughs> that finance is using. So we're talking to all of them. and. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's not easy. And right now, really, they're having too much business right now, every single one of them. 
the big four, Armenino and others. Um, so I, I think any exchange in the next six months that can come up with an external audit done by a somewhat known auditor is already doing a pretty good job. So there's two camps about like the lack of big four audits for like Binance or something, right? One is that Binance has something to hide, so they won't, they aren't willing to share all their internal information with a big four auditor. Um, but the other camp is more on the side of the exchanges and it's like these big four auditors don't really know, they're not comfortable with doing these audits and they don't want to be like, um, like that the fifth big five audit firm that went bankrupt because they audited Enron and screwed everything up, right? They don't want to be like that. So yes. I guess what do you see? Do you think it's A, that they could audit these big exchanges, but the big exchanges are not wanting to give so much access to their internal um, data? Or is it that the audit firms are kind of scared of like putting their name behind something and potentially ruining their business? So we, we're not, obviously, we're not familiar with um, other uh, centralized exchanges and their operations. Uh, with us, our ledgers have always been very clear. Um, we have no problems aside from complying with uh, GDPR and other privacy regulations to disclose all of our books to our auditors. Uh, but still, as with any company, exchange or not, um, it takes time for a good auditor to be comfortable enough to, to take on you as a client, right? And that's why I think all exchange operators today should be working on this. Because Got even it. if you try your best, you know, your ideal auditor may say to you, well, you know, we'll, we'll observe you for another year or two mm, got <laughs> it, before got it. Yeah. we'd like to consider you as a client. So, exactly. and, and that's why I think for any exchange operator, um, your brand, your reputation, whether you have ever had customer complaints, uh, you know, major uh, bad news or uh, compromises, you know, everything is at play here. That makes sense. And kind of moving away from the huge exchanges, um, I want to talk about the smaller exchanges. Like Sam Bankman Fried said famously that a lot of them are secretly insolvent right now. And then a few months later, um, well, his exchange went belly up, but then we saw some smaller ones like AAX in Hong Kong and some other random ones I've never heard of before all went belly up. So I guess what's your take on that? Do you have more alpha to share about exchange solvency for the smaller ones? Yeah, I, I would say that uh, Sam is probably right. And uh, why we say that is we can just look at past 12 months of history, right? We were extremely not comfortable with Terra Luna's design. That's why as an exchange, no matter how popular Luna was, we never listed Luna. The token, we never listed UST, the stable coin. And when Terra Luna blew up, we understood at that time that, you know, a lot of institutions have been hurt, but it's going to take many months until these damages really surface and yeah. these damages really start to bring down institutions. And so FTX, I think they were you know, also impacted by Terra Luna, by 3AC, and, and what's been happening past eight, nine months. So, um, and, and, and now that FTX has gone down, we're gonna continue to see the impact play out over the next six to 12 months. I will say though, this is a personal opinion of mine that given how much bad things has happened this year, any entity that makes it alive, makes it through this bear market, 
is going to be so battle tested in the next bull run. Like they're going to be like, oh, we we can't do this. Like we got to be more careful with this. We got to be more careful with that. It's it's going to make both operators and the community a lot more suspicious and conservative in terms of how things are run just because we have all these dominoes that fell in our collective mind, right? We're going to be like, don't you be that next BlockFi or don't you be that next FTX or, or Luna, right? We're going to remember all of these. And hopefully that means, I mean, we're going to make new mistakes in the future for sure, but hopefully at least the old mistakes won't be as prevalent and the ones that make it through this bear market will be super battle tested and ready for a lot more things coming their way. Absolutely. And that's why bear markets are really necessary. They're like winters, right? Winters, you wash out the, the weak and you let the strong prove themselves. And um, we talked about proof of custodial asset solvency. The best proof are actually bank runs. Let your customers, you know, withdraw as much as the, the, the last single piece of crypto, right? Then you prove it yourself. Yeah, Look, exactly. That's the best proof. You know, auditors, whatever, you know, proofs aside, we let everybody withdraw. We got nothing left. Yeah. Right? And people are going to come back because you proved yourself. So, um, and uh, it did happen recently, right? Um, right after uh, Terra Luna's collapse, within 30 days, Tether USDT was redeemed more than 17 billion. That's a record. It's not that easy, even if you have the reserves, but operationally, if you have the staff and the availability to process that much of redemption, 17 billion redeemed within 30 days, right? Is, you know, has given some confidence to Tether's users. Uh, the same thing with uh, exchanges right now, right? If you're having a bank run, you know, it, it is good proof. Exactly. And um, that's what I thought, too, because a few weeks ago, Crypto.com and other mid-tier, big-tier exchanges had their mini bank runs and they survived, which doesn't mean that they're still ultimately safe. But it does bring out more confidence that if yes. they can survive one, that they'll more likely be able to um, survive like more stuff being thrown at them. Totally. So, so and, and let's say as an exchange, let's say you're bank run, you know, this time in this bear market, you were bank run of total 10 billion worth of assets, right? That's just a record. Next time, if it's a 5 billion bank run, people are going to say, nah, you know, yeah, they handled exactly. 10 billion last time, exactly. right? So. Um, one other thing I want to ask you about is different ways to build and structure your exchange. Because Gary Gensler said that he doesn't want exchanges to have all these different functions like margin, lending, trading, blah, blah, blah. Everything is like commingled per se, right? So um, some people are like, you should split up the features completely, like have a custodian like BitGo or some other company. Um, I think that's what Bitstamp does. They use a third party custodian. Right. So what's your take on like splitting up exchange functions and how to design an exchange? I think uh, it's a good way to go. I think that's how financial markets have been structured and it's worked so far. Um, it's kind of like how you write software, right? You modulize everything. It's kind of like how DeFi is composed. Right, right, right. Um, so, and um, if we look at Xrex, we have to apply for a lot of different licenses because we custody customers' assets, so we need a custodial license, right? We offer uh, USDT to other local currencies, so... Uh, effectively, we need a Forex license, right? Because USDT is quasi US dollar. Right. Um, and then, uh, you know, um, in certain jurisdictions, we may need a broker dealer license. Um, and yes, so right now, exchanges are playing a lot of roles. And uh, I feel that in the next few years, these roles are going to be 
composed into separate entities, just like how TradFi is. Um, because it makes things a lot more clear. It does. And you, you does. segregate, you have risk segregators um, constructed easier that way. That makes sense. And um, this is just a side note, but I have some friends that work at BitGo, and I was like, their strategy is kind of like the, the TSMC of the crypto space because they only do custody, right? And it's like only building a fab and not like doing other stuff to compete with your customers. Um, but anyways, I want to talk, I want to shift gears to one function that exchanges have historically done in the past, lending and I guess generating yield through that way. A lot of centralized lending platforms have pretty much all went bankrupt and the future is uncertain for the space. So what's your take on the future of lending in the crypto space? I think lend and borrow are the essential building blocks to a financial system. But the important part is not the lending part, it's the borrowing part, <laughs> right? Who, so, so whenever you look at how, uh, you know, if you are parking your capital somewhere and it's generating some yield for you, you really have to, look into who are the borrowers and why are they willing to pay this type of yield to borrow from this platform. And if you cannot figure out the math, then it could be subsidized, which isn't going to last, or is going to be from your own principle, right, which, which is a Ponzi. Yeah, so. I mean, is there any future for these centralized, maybe not super over collateralized um, lending things because like Genesis, one of the top tier gold standard of lending um, services, they got blown up by Alameda, which was supposed to be a top tier hedge fund, right? Everyone thought so, heck I thought so. Um, and other people lent a lot to 3AC using the same collateral signed over and over again. So it's like the trust is like at all time lows. And I'm not sure I see how they can recover from that unless they just do super, super conservative. Um, what's your take? If I'm, if I'm to run such a business, I'll start with the super conservative assets and I'll do a really good job at how we mark to market them. Right? I mean, you can't mark to market at whatever the token price is today. You have to give a big discount um, because you know that if you have to liquidate these collateral, you're not going to, you know, you're, you're going you're gonna to be selling them at a big discount. Um, I would also focus on the most conservative collateral, for example, Bitcoin and Ethereum. But I would try really hard to get as many borrowers as possible, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Well, Wayne, this was a great conversation. Um, I'll leave some links for the viewers in the description. And um, thank you so much for sharing your insight with us. Yeah, great chat. Thank you for having me, Kevin.